Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. I am Professor Girard. In this section we've been covering the origins of some of the world's great religion, from Hinduism to Buddhism. Today we're studying the greatest, by numbers at least, which would be Christianity. Since I teach in Louisiana, most of my students are Christian and often they roll their eyes when I tell them that I'll spend the next hour explaining to them what their God is all about. They think that they already know. But when I ask them to define the term Christian, they often get bogged down in details about this or that difference between Pentecostals and Methodists and what have you, and then they miss the forest for the trees. And it can be surprisingly hard to look at your own beliefs and summarize them uh, in a few sentences. So stop the video for a second and imagine that you're talking to a Muslim friend from Yemen who knows squat about Christianity. How would you define the essence of your religion in three or four sentences? Go ahead. Think about it. That's harder than you think, right? Where do we start? Well, I think we should just proceed the same way that we've been doing with every other religion. What are the main texts? Who is the main prophet? Etc. So as far as the main book is concerned, we're dealing with the Bible, which means the book. When we studied Judaism, I mentioned that the first half of the Bible, the Old Testament, is actually Jewish in origin. So everything I said about the Torah, that would apply to Christians too. So what is a creation story? Well, the same one that the Jews have, Genesis, Adam and Eve, and so forth. The second half of the Bible, the New Testament, that is more specific to Christians. Remember how the Old Testament of the Jews predicted the coming of a Messiah? Well, the central theme of the New Testament is that this Messiah has come. This is Jesus Christ. When Matt talked about the Buddha, I mentioned how hard it can be to retrace the life of a prophet. Sure, we have plenty of stories, but they come to us through the disciples of that prophet, who often wrote years or even decades after the fact. So these stories can be suspect. And I'm not saying here that Jesus never existed. He was mentioned by some other authors, like Flavius Josephus, who were not Christian, and so are less likely to be biased. Where things get complicated is when we get into the details, whether Jesus actually said this or that, whether he actually performed miracles. There were plenty of accounts of his life, they are known as the Gospels, uh, but they often conflicted with each other, so the situation is murky. So here are some aspects of his life as told by the Gospels. First, he was born, and that fulfilled the promise of a Messiah. He was a messenger sent by God, he was his son. Then, the Gospels kind of skip forward 30 years to when Jesus becomes an adult, preaches his message, and then gets killed by Roman authorities, only to come back to life. Notice how these two events, his life and his birth, would correspond to the two main holidays on the Christian calendar, Christmas and Easter, so no surprise there. So to get back to our original question, what are the central aspects of Christianity, which all Christians, from Mormons to Presbyterians to Catholics, would agree upon? Well, one, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And two, his death and resurrection are proof of God's forgiveness of human sins. Through him, Christians can earn salvation and eternal life. Now, if you read the New Testament, or at least the translation of it, since the original is in Aramaic and Greek, you'll notice that the teachings of Jesus are often vague and that they contradict other parts of the Bible. The Old Testament says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And then Jesus says, turn the other cheek. So which is which? So no surprise then that other Jews saw Jesus as a heretic and they were happy to let the Romans execute him. He contradicted much of the Old Testament. So because of all the gaps in the teachings of Jesus, there were three main questions that were left unanswered when he died. The first was, who was he preaching to? His fellow Jews or the whole world? That was not clear. Two, he promised that a new kingdom of God would come. But did he mean an actual kingdom right here on earth or was it something metaphorical somewhere up in the sky? And three, what was the timeline? Would that kingdom come now, very soon, tomorrow? Or was it more of a long-term project? The person who did a lot to clarify these teachings would be Paul of Tarsus, known as St. Paul to Catholics, because he clarified many matters of doctrine in his letters uh, to early Christian communities. 
and he answered the three questions I just outlined. So one, who could be a Christian? Well, everybody, not just Jews, but Gentiles too. Christianity would be universal. Two, what was this kingdom of God? Well, not an actual kingdom with a king and an army and tax collectors, uh, because what was Caesar's, that would remain Caesar's. Uh, the kingdom promised by Jesus was something in an other world, in heaven. Which, by the way, was a clever way of reassuring Romans who were always concerned about rivals challenging their conquests. Remember that there were Jewish revolts in the first century AD, and Jesus sounded a lot like a rabble rouser who wanted independence for Israel. According to tradition, he was crucified under the letters I-N-R-I, which means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, other way to mock him for challenging the authority of Rome. So St. Paul made it clear he had no intention to kick the Roman Empire out of Judea. As for the third question, when would the reign of Jesus come, St. Paul said, anytime now, and probably soon. That's called being a millennial. And I'm not referring here to people who like avocado toast. I have a few of those in my home. No, millennial here would be someone who thinks that the end is near, that the second coming of Jesus is imminent. This meant that early Christians felt a great sense of urgency. Jesus would return soon, and it was important to repent now and convert others now. So Christianity was far more aggressive at converting than some others, other religions that we've studied, uh, like Hinduism, which have a cyclical vision of history and lack the same sense of urgency. So aside from clarifying these three points, St. Paul played an important role as a proselytizer, someone who spread the faith, who converted others. He spent much time in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, in places like Turkey and Greece. He spoke Greek, the lingua franca, the common tongue, uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, which made his task much earlier. Also helping was the fact that he lived during the Pax Romana, that period in the first centuries uh, AD when Rome was dominant and there was internal peace. So it was pretty easy to travel from one province to the next, spreading the word as you went without being attacked by bandits or armies. Same thing in the western part of the Roman Empire, though with a different language, uh, Latin would have been dominant there. So what made Christianity expand so fast then? As I said, the fact that everyone could convert, not just Jews, the sense of urgency, and the Pax Romana. But the egalitarian views of Christianity, that also helped. Uh, we've studied some pretty unequal religions so far, like Hinduism, where people are not equal in the eyes of the gods. By contrast, Christianity spread that everyone, rich or poor, had an equal shot at salvation. This made Christianity very popular among the downtrodden, especially women and slaves, which combined represented over half of the Roman Empire. Compare this to the cult of Mithras, M-I-T-H-I-S. Uh, that was a religion that shared many similarities with early Christianity, except that Mithraism was intended for men, especially Roman soldiers, uh, so he, its appeal was more limited. And not surprisingly, there aren't that many Mithraists uh, today. The Roman Empire was used to religious diversity. Uh, Romans had many gods of their own, and over the years they had successfully incorporated the gods of Greece, of Gaul, of Egypt, and so forth. So Christians seemed to be just another one of the many Jewish sects in existence. The problem was that Christians were adamantly monotheistic. So they didn't just worship another god, they rejected the existence of all the others. And that was a major issue because the Roman Emperor claimed to be a god himself. There were temples dedicated to the Emperor throughout the Empire. Making sacrifices to the Emperor, that was expected of all Roman subjects. Uh, Polycius didn't see a problem with that, but Christians did. Uh, so their refusal to honor the Emperor made them suspicious in the eyes of the story. Uh, they were accused of being traitors. There was also a concept in ancient Rome called God Peace, and the idea was to keep the gods happy so that they wouldn't exact revenge. So a good citizen was expected to make the proper sacrifices for the benefit of all, otherwise mayhem would ensue. So by refusing to honor other gods, Christians risked uh, angering them, at which point those gods would send an epidemic, locusts, or what have you, and so when an actual catastrophe happened, like the great fire of Rome under Nero, well, it was easy to blame Christians for what happened. And that led to several waves of persecution in the first centuries AD. Uh, 
you know how cruel Romans could be, so you can imagine how awful the treatment of Christians was. Surprisingly, though, persecution failed to stamp out the spread of Christianity. In fact, it somehow did the opposite. Christians often died with great serenity, confident that they were earning their spots in heaven. And the Romans, who appreciated courage, were impressed by that. Fellow Christians also commemorated the memory of these victims, or martyrs as they were called, and in fact a good chunk of the saints that are currently on the Catholic calendar originated as early Christians who died some horrible deaths at the end of the Romans. So eventually, Romans stopped the persecutions and they gave up on stamping out Christianity. Uh, one Roman emperor, Constantine was his name, even issued an edict, which is a law, in Milan, Italy, in 313, which called for toleration. From that point forward, Christians could practice their faith openly and the persecutions finally came to an end. And then Constantine himself converted. And so when the emperor of Rome was baptized, this encouraged many other Romans to follow suit. And eventually, Christianity went from being a small religion persecuted by authorities to being the official state religion of Rome. And that would be another big step in the growth of Christianity, because from that point forward, Christianity received the support of authorities, whether it's the Roman emperors or, after that, the rulers of successor states uh, in Byzantium or medieval Europe. Despite the efforts of St. Paul, early Christianity was a doctrinal mess. There were many rival accounts of the life of Jesus called the Gospels. In fact, we're still finding some. In the 1940s, scholars found a trove of early Christian texts called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And just a couple of years ago, another fragment of papyrus surf surfaced in which uh, Jesus spoke about his wife, which was quite a bombshell, as you can imagine, Though I read in the paper just yesterday that this fragment was apparently a forgery. So the question of the marital status of Jesus, that remains a mystery. And by yesterday I meant uh, August 2020, which is when I'm taping this. The problem of sorting out the gospel that were legit, what is called the canon, from those that were not, the apocrypha, that was also a question faced by early Christians. And more generally separating the official doctrine of the church from non-standard beliefs, what we would call heresy. A key debate centered on the divine nature of Jesus. Every Christian agreed that he was a messiah, of course, that's the basic belief of all Christians. But was he the human son of God or a God himself? One group of early Christians called the Arians, A-R-I-A-N-S, believed that Jesus was essentially human. Sure, he was a son of God, but he lived among us. Maybe he got married, he ate, he slept, he laughed, he died, just like any of us. All the Christians thought that he was divine. He was a god, not a mortal. So the fathers of the church, and I mean fathers, all of them were men, gathered up in Nicaea, a city in today's Turkey, to settle the debate. And that's called a council, a big gathering where church leaders decide what is canonical and what is heretical. These are pretty rare. In 325, the Council of Nicaea decided that Jesus was a God. Specifically, they developed the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which were distinct, but also one at the same time. So that meant that Arianism, which preached that Jesus was a man, that was now considered a heresy. So it survived for centuries thereafter anyway. And we'll see it pop up a lot when we study the Byzantine Empire. So that was another strength of the early Christian church. It was centralized, well-organized, and rather ruthless when it came to getting everybody in line. Uh, and that meant that the church remained quite united for a thousand years, until that is a big schisms with Orthodox Christians and later the Protestants. Uh, we'll get to those in a minute. I've mentioned before that religious doctrine is composed of two elements. Uh, one, what the prophet initially says, Revelation, the Gospels in the case of Christians, and then two, what emerged over time as historical development. Monasticism would be a good example of the latter, and that term simply refers to monks. You won't see them anywhere in the Gospel, except for the fact that John the Baptist and uh, Jesus spent time in the desert living off little on their own. So for the most part, monasticism emerged over time, long after the life of Jesus. And the term comes from a Greek word that means to live alone, uh, so monks would be people who live away from lay people. That's it. 
the early examples of monks would be individuals who practiced uh, extreme forms of asceticism, punishing the body. Saint Simeon, for example, lived in the 5th century AD and supposedly spent 36 years on a little platform on top of a pillar, completely cut off from the others. And that practice would be called eremitic monasticism, basically hermits, we'd say today. But there was also cenobitic monasticism, which means monks who live alone, but as part of a community, meaning they live with a few other monks, but that community is cut off from lay people. And that's the form that became dominant over time. And since these monks lived in a community, they would have to agree on a set of norms that's called the rule of the monastic order. And those rules vary, but in Catholic Europe, many of these orders trace their origins back to Benedict of Nursham, the Benedictine orders. And in Eastern Europe, where the Orthodox Church is dominant, monks generally follow the rule of Saint Basil the Great. Uh, but there are plenty of variations. Later on, we'll mention the Templars, for example. These were warrior monks uh, during the Crusades. And there were, and there are, plenty of female orders as well. Monasticism goes for both sexes. But whatever the specifics, all of these orders follow the three main rules. Poverty, chastity, obedience. And I'm mentioning all this because monastic orders played a huge role when the Roman Empire collapsed and Western Europe plunged into what is called the Dark Ages. We'll study that in the next section. In the period of chaos that followed, monasteries and convents were the few remaining islands of stability and culture in Europe. Uh, monks, nuns, they were some of the few literate people, so they played an important role preserving ancient texts and writing about the history of their time, like universities today. Monasteries, like the Order of Cluny in France, were extremely rich too, and that might seem strange because monks, after all, made a vow of poverty. But that applied to them individually, not to the whole community. So monasteries, as a whole, uh, they would take over the assets of monks when they joined, and then they would get donations from the faithful, and then they employed monks who were supposed to work hard and earn nothing and obey orders, and they bought land and rented out that land. So monastic orders were very rich. We'll get back to that when we study the Templars, who were essentially the Chase Manhattan Bank of their time in the Crusades. I am of various minds when it comes to the whole notion of monasticism. Uh, on the one hand, there were scholars like me, among the few people who did serious scholarship in the Middle Ages. I'm thinking, for example, of Abelard and Eloise, for example, who are both a couple, uh, but also a monk and a nun. Complicated love life. Their wealth uh, also financed magnificent monuments, Mont Saint-Michel and Normandy. That would be one of my favorite abbeys. Uh, but then there's something fundamentally selfish about monks, especially those who are cloisters, who don't go out in the world. Uh, they hold themselves up to higher standards so as to achieve their own salvation, and then too bad if other Christians go to hell. I'll let you ponder that question on your own. Let's now move our, uh, our chronology into the second millennium AD. As Christianity expanded throughout Europe, an important question emerged. Who is in charge? The two main people who could claim to speak for all Christians were in Rome and in Byzantium. In Rome, the Pope claimed precedence because he descended from St. Peter, and also because he lived in Rome, which used to be the capital of the Christian Roman Empire. But the western part of the Roman Empire collapsed in 476 AD, and the only part that survived of that empire was in the east. We call it the Byzantine Empire uh, because its capital was Byzantium. That would be Istanbul today, or also known as Constantinople because it was found, founded by Constantine, the same Roman emperor who converted to Christianity. So for that reason, the Byzantine emperors had good reason to see themselves as a true heir to the Roman Empire and as the true leaders of Christendom. And so that led to power disputes with the popes in Rome. Those political struggles were often expressed through disputes over doctrinal matters. Uh, for example, people in Byzantium venerated paintings of Jesus and Mary. Um, these are called icons, and they remain central to Christian practice in Greece and Russia today. Uh, frankly, there are similar practices in Western Europe as well. If you travel to Spain during the Holy Week, for example, you'll see many Christians taking statues of saints out on procession around town. Uh, but the popes in Rome thought that the cult, of, uh, the cult of icons in Byzantium, that was really a cult of idols, which was prohibited under the Ten Commandments, and they tried to stamp out the practice. And the, uh, the Byzantines, they disagreed. 
And that led to centuries of dispute, uh, which eventually led to a formal rift in 1054 AD called the Great Schism, capital G, capital S. And remember that the term schism, uh, that means a split within a religion. So from that point on, there would be two Christian churches, a Catholic church in Western Europe, which rejected icons and answer to the Pope, and the Christian Orthodox Church in Eastern Europe, which worshipped icons and answered to their own authorities called the Patriarchs. Uh, beyond that, the two churches remain quite similar. I have been to both Catholics, uh, Catholic weddings and Orthodox weddings, and frankly, the differences were fairly minute. Uh, the Orthodox Church today is that remains pretty strong in Greece, Bulgaria, Russia today, or wherever you have Eastern European immigrants, like in the US. The second great schism to split Christianity took place about five centuries later. The central figure was a German monk called Martin Luther. He began as a Catholic, since this was a dominant form of Christianity in Western Europe in his time, but one who always had second thoughts about the Catholic Church. He was obsessed with salvation in particular, and he always wondered whether the practices promoted by the Pope were enough to save his soul, especially the notion of good works donating to the church, showing up in church, following the, pro, uh, the proper rituals, etc. Martin Luther wondered, you know, was that enough to get me a spot in heaven? He also spent a lot of time writing anti-Semitic rants, but that's another story. Aside from Jews, the main focus of his ire was indulgences. Uh, this was a practice whereby Christians gave money to the church in exchange for scripts of paper uh, that were supposed to help loved ones speed their way through purgatory. Martin Luther thought that this was an abuse of power. To him, the church did not have the authority to decide who went to heaven or not, especially based on how much money you had. And to make things worse, the 16th century was a time when the Catholic Church was not at its best. This was a time of the Borgias, a dynasty of corrupt popes. And I mean dynasty. They had kids, and those kids became popes. So 15th and 16th century popes were also very aggressive at raising funds through the sale of indulgences, in part to finance the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So that angered Martin Luther so much that he wrote a pamphlet called the 95 Theses and dramatically nailed it on the door of the Church of Wittenberg in Germany. Uh, the year was 1517. And when he did this, Martin Luther was not planning to split from the Catholic Church, but to reform it to convince the popes to end the selling of indulgences and bring the church back to a more spiritual, less mercantile past. Uh, but the church authorities, they would not budge. Uh, they gathered yet another council, a gathering of elders, in the city of Trent. And there they made a few minor changes to the way that priests were trained and such, but otherwise they stood firm. The church had the authority to help people go to heaven, no matter what this little monk in Germany might say. So as a result, the dispute over indulgences turned into a more permanent split. On one side would be the Catholics, who stuck with the Pope in Rome, and on the other, those who protested against the Church, hence the term Protestants. And with time, the critique of the Church by Martin Luther became more comprehensive than just indulgences. And the key issue to him always was salvation. How do I get to heaven? Not by buying indulgences, obviously, but not by showing up in church every Sunday and obeying my priest, either. Uh, for Martin Luther, salvation did not come from good works, ritual, donations, but from what was inside of you. Salvation by faith alone. And the church had no say-so in the matter. Only God did. It was a private matter between each Christian and God. So this theology short-circuited the entire hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Martin Luther was also a scholar who translated the Bible into German. Uh, this was the era of the Renaissance and humanism, so European scholars were rediscovering all the ancient classics and learning Greek and Hebrew so that they could read uh, ancient texts for themselves. By that point in time, the official version of the Bible was called the Vulgate. Uh, this was a Latin translation done by the Catholic Church, which in practice very few people read, since most people couldn't read Latin or even read at all. But Martin Luther went back to the original text in Hebrew and Greek, and he found that the Vulgate was often inaccurate. So he made a new translation in German, a language that his fellow Christians could understand, at least in Germany. And that's called the vernacular, uh, whatever the common tongue would be 
in a given spot. So now Christians in Germany, they could read the Bible for themselves, finally, and take control of their spirituality. And as it happened, Gutenberg invented the printed press around the same time, also in Germany, so books became much cheaper too. It was now possible for average folks to own a printed Bible, whereas a handwritten Bible had been prohibitively expensive before that. And once Luther compared the original Bible to the existing practices of the Church, he found discrepancies everywhere. No surprise for us, since religions consist of the original revelation and practices that are added over time. So let's start with the Pope. Where is he in the Gospels? Nowhere. Same thing with bishops, and cardinals, and monks. So Luther rejected the whole hierarchy, which meant quitting his day job. He was defrocked, which means that he stopped being a monk. What about the vow of celibacy that monks and priests make in the Catholic Church? Again, that's a historical development, and a rather late one, not a biblical requirement. So Luther got married, which is still the norm among Protestant ministers today. What about the seven sacraments that are central to Catholicism? Some of them have roots in the Gospel. We know that Jesus was baptized, that he attended a wedding, that he took communion, obviously. Uh, but the Gospels have nothing to say about ordination, or the last rites, or confirmation. So these had to go. As for the cult of the saints and the Virgin Mary, Martin Luther rejected, uh, rejected all of those because they were, in his view, polytheistic in nature. So from a simple dispute over indulgences, the Reformation turned into a more profound reinvention of the nature of Christianity itself. And that schism became permanent. We still have it today. One thing that had kept the Catholic Church united over a thousand years was its top-down nature. A council of the Church would decide what was canon, and if anyone disagreed, like the Arians, or later the Albigensians, they were cast out as heretics and mercilessly stamped out. The minute you start telling people, here's the Bible, read it on your own, and uh, make your own opinion on the matter, then these people will come up with a thousand interpretations. It's a long text, and it's often contradictory. As a result, the Reformation led to the Lutheran Church, but also a thousand other churches, because various reformers, uh, they came up with their own interpretation of the Bible. In England, King Henry VIII was mad that the Pope would not let him divorce his wife. So he created a new church, the Church of England, what we call the Anglicans today, where divorce would be legal. Which incidentally also allowed Henry VIII to become the boss of his own church instead of deferring to the Pope in Rome and to keep all the church taxes and tithes for himself. And that would be uh, the equivalent of Episcopalians here in the U.S. today, the U.S. version of the Anglican Church. In Switzerland, John Calvin, or Jean Calvin, came up with the notion of predestination. He thought that God earmarked some people for salvation from the get-go. Though strangely, he didn't tell us who was saved and who wasn't, which I always found strange. Anyway, that led to the Calvinist Church, which is notable in Switzerland and in France, and eventually the Presbyterian Church in Scotland and in the U.S. And then all the reformers noted that Jesus was baptized very late as an adult. So why did the Catholic Church baptize infants so early? And that reason was practical. Uh, many children died young in the Middle Ages, that was before the invention of vaccination, uh, so parents were afraid that uh, these kids might die without being baptized in which case we'd go to a place called limbo instead of heaven. And that's the origin of the expression being in limbo, which means being stuck in a state of uncertainty. So Anabaptists said, let's get baptized as adults, just like Jesus did. And a whole new slew of churches appeared, such as the Amish in the U.S. today. So if you ever opened a phone book and wondered how come there are 40 different Christian churches in my town, the answer is Martin Luther. The Reformation itself was incomplete, because some people embraced Lutheranism or some other Protestant church, uh, but many remained Catholic as well. So Europe was divided between multiple denominations, each of them convinced that they were right and all the others were heretics. And that led to many wars of religions in 16th and 17th century Europe. Germany, which was ground zero for the Reformation, endured a conflict called the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s, and that completely laid waste to the country. In my native France, most people remained Catholic, but there was a significant Calvinist minority, Protestants. And on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572, Catholics attacked Protestants and killed 
dozens of thousands of them right there in the street in Paris and elsewhere with swords and such. And that's just one massacre one day. Eventually, King Louis XIV of France decided that Protestants could not practice their faith in France, and so many of them had to flee from France. And still today, there are quite a few families here in the U.S. whose ancestors were Huguenots. Well, if you ever wonder, a Huguenot, that's simply a Calvinist who left France around the time of Louis XIV. Thankfully, uh, religious intolerance is less of, less of a factor in Europe today. Protestants and Catholics don't murder each other in the streets anymore. Uh, in fact, the majority of Europeans today are either non-practicing Christians or agnostic or even atheists, uh, which is quite a striking development considering that Europe uh, was so associated with Christianity for so many centuries. Outside Europe, however, Christianity has been quite successful recently, which brings us to our last question. Why has this religion grown? I already mentioned proselytism, the egalitarian appeal of Christianity, its early association with the Roman Empire. And if you push a narrative further to the modern period, you'll notice that many Christians can be found in Asia, Africa, and the Americas today. And that's because, in part, Christian orders, like the Jesuits, sent missionaries worldwide to convert others, proselytism. But notice also how many Christians in Mexico and Peru are Catholic, whereas most Christians in Australia are Protestant. How come? Think about it for a sec. Well, the answer, right, is colonialism. From the 1500s forward, European states took over colonies, not just to exploit them economically, but also to convert local populations. So Mexican Aztecs were converted to Catholicism by Spain. Australian Aborigines were converted to Protestantism by uh, England, and, and so forth. And that's how uh, also uh, the US, which is a former branch, uh, French, British, Dutch, and Spanish colony, uh, became Christian. Well, majority Christian. Uh, the US government itself does not support a particular religion. That's in the non-establishment clause of the First Amendment, if you don't believe me. Uh, also notice on this map that Christian presence in the US varies a lot. Some denominations are stronger in some parts of the US than others. And the reason is immigration, which also ple uh, played a huge role in spreading Christianity worldwide, especially in the 19th century, uh, when the European population ballooned due to vaccination and many Europeans relocated elsewhere. So why are there many Catholics around Boston, you might ask? Well, because many Irish people moved there during the Great Potato Famine. Why do you have many Italians around uh, New York? Again, that's immigration later on. Why so many Lutherans in Minnesota, Ohio, Wisconsin? They came from Germany and Sweden and Norway. And right here in Louisiana, many Catholics, they would be descendants of the great French Cajun migration, the Grand Dérangement, as they called it. And the large proportion of Catholics in southern Texas, so California, that would reflect a more recent wave of immigration, largely from Latin America. So a lot of factors that would explain Christianity's expansion over the past 2,000 years. Well, this would take our story all the way to the present time. And so now you now know that the basic precepts of Christianity are, one, Jesus is the Messiah, and two, he promised to us eternal life. You also know why there are so many denominations of Christianity today, Martin Luther. And you also know why Christianity gained so many converts over the years, colonialism and immigration would be some of those answers. So hopefully I fulfilled my initial promise. Even if you're a Christian yourself, you learned a thing or two along the way. If not, well, just join me next time as we study the last religion on our list, and that would be Islam. Goodbye. Au revoir.